um, good morning and good evening for those for those of you joining us from different parts of the world, I'm Jisoo Kim, director of the GW Institute for Korean Studies and Korea Foundation Associate Professor of History, International Affairs, and East Asian Languages and Literatures. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to our second annual North Korea Economic Forum Conference. This conference was initially scheduled to have it this past spring, but was canceled due to COVID-19. I'm glad that we were able to reschedule and host this virtual conference today. Um, since we're conducting virtually, we have decided we have divided the sessions to different days so that we don't torture our speakers as well as attendees to stay in front of the screen all day. Um, so the next two sessions will take place next week on October 12th and 13th. Hope you can continue to join us engaging in this important discussions about North Korea. This North Korea Economic Forum is part of our policy program. I would like to thank KDA School of Public Policy and Management for generously funding our policy program. The forum aims to promote our understanding of North Korean economic issues and to expand the network among the various North Korean economy experts in Washington. This forum is mostly a closed and off the record meeting where policy experts in Washington can freely and seriously discuss the critical issues. But it also organizes two public events throughout the academic year, one in the fall and the other in the spring. So this means that in addition to this conference, there will be another public event coming up this semester and it will be a panel discussion that will be held in November. I would like to thank our distinguished speakers, presenters and discussants for joining this conference. Without them, we could not have hosted this virtual conference. I would also like to thank the steering committee for organizing the conference and my special thanks to Yono Kim, Associate Director of GWIX and Mina Kim, our program coordinator for all of their hard work to make this conference possible. I very much look forward to the presentations and discussions today and next week. Now I would like to introduce our honorable guest speakers to give their congratulatory remarks. In order to save time, I'll be introducing the brief version for the longer version of their bios, please refer to the program. I would like to first introduce Interim Dean of the LU School of International Affairs at GW, Ilana Feldman. She's a historical anthropologist with regional expertise on the Middle East. She currently serves on the board of the Middle East Studies Association, is vice president of the board of the Palestinian American Research Center, is co-editor of a Cornell University Press book series titled Police Worlds, Studies in Security, Crime and Governance, and is a member of the advisory council of ANERA, previously having served as a member of the board. She received her PhD in anthropology and history from the University of Mich Michigan. She's been teaching at GW since 2007. Please welcome Dean Feldman. Thank you, Jisoo, and welcome to everybody. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to um, welcome you to this conference. Um, as Jisoo said, the North Korea Economic Forum uh, launched a very successful annual conference um, last year, and in this second annual conference, uh, it will continue to provide an audience in Washington and now increasingly beyond uh, with a unique opportunity to understand the North Korean economy in a holistic way, learning not only about the current state of the North Korean economy, but also its relations with the domestic politics and market forces, international political and economic dynamics. Um, and the, this gives me an opportunity to highlight the importance of the Korean studies program in Washington, especially in the policy field. Uh, it participates in educating future policy circle elites who will develop their careers in government, academia, think tanks, media, NGOs, et cetera. And it is really essential that in the nation's capital, we in cooperation with leading experts provide a Washington audience with a deep and, ver and various perspectives about the Korean Peninsula. I want to here give special thanks to the KDI School of Public Policy and Management, which is co-sponsor of the conference for providing a generous grant to GWIX. Um, with this, GWIX has been able to host a series of very meaningful career-related policy events, as well as to provide scholarship and stipend to GW students. So we're excited about the future cooperation between GW and KDIS and look forward to continuous and deeper engagements with KDIS. So congratulations to you all and have a great conference. Thank you, Elena. I know today is a very busy day for you. So I really appreciate your time. Um, next speaker is Dean of KDI School of Public Policy and Management, Chong Il Yu. Dean Yu served as a member of the Public Funds Management Committee, the Advisory Committee for the Constitutional Revision Committee of the National Assembly and the Commission on Financial Administration Reform. 
As a leader in civic movement, he is currently the head of Knowledge Cooperative for Good Governance, a network of researchers and the president and the president of Jubilee Bank, an NGO working to help debt-stricken low-income individuals. He received his PhD in economics from Harvard University and taught at University of Cambridge, University of Notre Dame, and ritz macon University before taking professorship at the KDI School of Public Policy and Management. Um, although he was not able to make live this morning, it's late in the evening in Seoul, so we appreciate him sending us a video to deliver his congratulatory remarks. We'll now turn on the video. Professor Ilana Feldman, Interim Dean of the Elliott School, and Mr. Daniel Ward, Chair of the North Korea Economic Forum, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. As the host of the North Korea Economic Forum Annual Conference, and on behalf of KDI School of Public Policy and Management, I want to express my warm welcome to all of you. It's a great pleasure and honor to co-host this conference uh, with our colleagues from GWIX and experts in North Korea uh, during this extraordinary time. I'd like to express our deep appreciation to Professor Ilana Feldman and Daniel Wirtz for their participation today. Uh, we are also grateful to all the other uh, distinguished speakers and participants for their time. Your presence uh, certainly adds a unique and invaluable dimension uh, to the anticipated discussions today. We appreciate the opportunity to continue our work with you virtually, although uh, we would have preferred some face-to-face -face time with all of you. I never would have imagined that this year's North Korea Economic Forum would have to be uh, within the context of this unprecedented global pandemic. North Korea was already facing monumental challenges before coming into 2020, and now, uh, with the outbreak of COVID-19 and its taxing consequences and the heavy floods on top of that, uh, the situation is truly dire. Uh, with the recent killing of a South Korean official by North Korean troops, efforts for inter-Korean engagement is likely to take a step back as South Korean people demand justice for this brutal killing. Uh, we certainly do have our work cut out for us. Uh, we have chosen to focus our talks today on the areas of public infrastructure, tourism, and mobile communications in North Korea. According to NK News, there was an estimated uh, 350,000 Chinese tourists that visited North Korea in uh, 2019, providing much-needed revenue uh, for the country crippled by economic sanctions. Now that COVID-19 has all but suspended tourism, uh, the economic hardships in North Korea must all the more pronounced. Uh, this pandemic also brings to light every country's healthcare infrastructure and more starkly, its weaknesses. Given North Korea's uh, proclivity for military spending, public infrastructure expenditure has been limited. I look forward to hearing more about the status of North Korea's public infrastructure. One can imagine, ironically, the lack of roads and transportation uh, but may have curtailed the spread of COVID-19 within the country. Similarly, uh, it would be interesting to learn more about where the North Koreans are today concerning mobile money and the prevalence of uh, mobile communication in its prevention measures against COVID-19. I think we need to embrace the fact that the pandemic will shape how we do anything going forward. At this critical juncture of human history, we hope this conference serves as a channel to approach the many tasks at hand when dealing with North Korea. Uh, as we work to normalize relations and strive to better understand how to effectively forge cooperation with North Korea, we need to take it upon ourselves to ensure that we are prepared to effectively engage with, with them. This conference will greatly contribute to identifying ways to support North Korea's economic development and to offer solutions on how to overcome its many challenges that have only been exacerbated by this year's events. We look forward to the valuable contributions this annual forum will be making. Allow me to take this opportunity to 
thank the GW Institute for Korean Studies for co-hosting this event. Uh, we've been delighted with our partnership with Three Weeks since it was forged last year. Uh, you have been instrumental partners in our public diplomacy through education cooperation program. Uh, through multifaceted cooperation, we hope to enrich the education and research at GWIX and advance interest in and understanding of Korean issues. We thank you uh, for making the most of our current state of affairs and ensuring that our learning continues and our partnership flourishes. Once again, uh, let me express my sincere gratitude to all of you for your dedication and participation in this conference. Thank you very much. All right, um, thank you very much, Dean Yu. Um, okay, our next speaker is Daniel Wirtz, who is the current chair of the North Korea Economic Forum. He is also the program manager at the National Committee on North Korea, where he has worked since 2011. Mr. Wirtz manages research and publications at NCNK and is also the lead researcher and editor of North Korea in the World, um, an interactive website exploring North Korea's external economic and diplomatic relations. He received master's degrees in international and world history in a joint program from Columbia University and the London School of Economics, and a bachelor's degree in history from Wesleyan University. Please welcome Mr. Wards. Thank you very much, Professor Kim, and thanks especially to Dean Feldman and Dean Yujong Gil for their very kind introductory remarks. Uh, very pleased to welcome our audience today for our second North Korea Economic Forum annual conference and hope that many of the people in the audience will be able to tune in again on Monday and Tuesday next week as we'll discuss sources, methods, and pitfalls in researching North Korea. Uh, we're coming into the last quarter of what's been a very tumultuous and challenging year, uh, both for those of us here in the U.S. and in a very different set of ways uh, for people in North Korea and around the world. Uh, North Korea's decision to close its borders back in January of this year probably helped uh, prevent the brunt of the coronavirus from hitting North Korea, but it's created some very uh, far-reaching second-order effects on the North Korean economy and certainly on people's daily lives. Uh, it's too soon, in my opinion, to be able to say exactly what those uh, second order effects are thus far and what they will be as the border closure and the second order effects of COVID continue. Uh, but certainly they'll be pretty far reaching in their breadth. And it's important to consider the trend lines that have been going up to the point uh, we're looking at now. And I'm really excited to have a great set of panelists uh, to discuss those trend lines. Uh, I'd like to express special thanks to Young Ho Kim as well, who will not only be a presenter today on airtime and mobile money in North Korea, but also was really instrumental in organizing this conference. Uh, so thank you, Young Ho. And back to uh, Professor Chi Soo Kim, who will turn it over to the main panel. Okay, um, thank you so much. Thank you once again to our honorable guest speakers for giving um, very meaningful introductory and congratu congratulatory remarks. Um, all right, now I would like to turn it over to my dear colleague, Professor Celeste Arrington, uh, to moderate the first session. All right, um, Celeste. Great, thank you, Jisoo, um, for that introduction. And um, I also want to echo Dan's comments and thanking Yonol Kim for organizing this panel. Um, so our, our panel this morning is going to focus as both um, Dean Yu jong il and uh, Dan Wirtz mentioned, on the development trends in North Korea. We're gonna start off uh, with three presentations from Jerome Sauvage uh, and then Matt Kaluza and then Yono Kim. We'll follow that with um, discussant comments from um, Chungo Kim and Randall Spadoni. So let me uh, introduce each of our three speakers before they speak. We'll begin with Jerome Sauvage. He is uh, currently an independent consultant on international development and humanitarian affairs, um, but he has previously worked for the UN uh, Development Program Office in Pyongyang for three years. And the focus of his discussion this morning uh, will be, as Dean Yu jong mentioned, on the state of public infrastructure in the DPRK 
particularly focused on power, water, sanitation, and health, which are all um, especially important concerns, uh, very interesting in this COVID pandemic era that we live in today. So I think without further ado, I will turn it over to um, Jerome Sauvage. Let me just uh, briefly say, please, uh, if you have questions for the panelists as you were going along, enter them in the Q&A um, portion, which is at the bottom of your screen. So thank you, Jerome, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Kim, uh, Dean Feldman. Thank you, Celeste. And great to see so many uh, friends uh, from uh, times past and current uh, over here. Do you see the uh, first uh, uh, page of the PowerPoint presentation? Yes? Okay. This presentation is, uh, I was pleased to do it because uh, in a way, uh, power, water and sanitation and health have an interest for me in a way at two levels. First level in some ways is that I lived in North Korea for a few years and uh, power, water, and health are things that I was wondering about every day as, a, as an individual living there, uh, usually about missing it, and sometimes about having it, but not always uh, very satisfactorily. And I even spent some time in a North Korean hospital because I had a, a back problem. Um, so, um, but more importantly, uh, as the uh, coordinator uh, of the UN, uh, we had projects in all uh, parts of the DPRK dealing with power, water, and health. Uh, so this was an important issue uh, for, for, for us, and I'm, and I'm glad I was able to, do, to, to talk a, bit, uh, a little bit. I, you've had, I think on October 2nd, a very good presentation with NAPSNET, David von Hipkel on, on, on energy. And my approach, because of the work we were doing, will tend to be on the impact of infrastructure in North Korea as it affects the public. Um, I, I am less um, versed, if you will, in the big macro issue of, um, of, of, of those aspects. I would be more of a, how it, the, these, these infrastructure affects the public. Uh, let me begin right away. Um, public infrastructure in North Korea has not recovered from the collapse of the 1990s. Um, have a 1990s is the end of the cooperation with the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was a trading partner, but it was also a provider of spare parts, of equipment, and of course, um, DPRK uh, depended on it very much. The mid 1990s are, is also the floods, uh, very important for that period, which, as we know, ushered the Great Famine, which led to the opening of uh, North Korea. But today, uh, energy per capita use is energy is about a third of what it was in the 1990s. Um, so you really see the difference uh, in, 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 in those years in the loss of capacity. And the number in health that I chose is maternal mortality rate. That number went from 1990, it was at 50 death for 100,000 live birth to 82 death for 100,000 live birth. Um, this is a, is a very telling number when you know that for the rest of East, East Asia, excluding Japan, uh, of course, the maternal mortality rate for the same period reduced by 72%. So we really understand the impact, uh, the, the loss of capacity in the North Korean infrastructure uh, with uh, two of these numbers. I chose to share an interesting uh, doc, uh, document that the UN had prepared when we were working on an energy project um, at the time. It shows household energy consumption uh, in rural household in North Korea. Starting with cooking and heating, the old ondol system, you know, in which you have cooking and heating part of the same system in the house. The North Korean household uses 500 pounds of wood per year, 100 pounds of crop residue, that can be what you pick in the field, you know, corn husk, for example, 250 pounds of coal, and uses 34 kilowatt of electricity. As far as electricity is concerned, they also use 63 kilowatt per year for lighting, 58 kilowatt for electrical appliances, and 40 kilowatt for others, I think, for example, um, charging your cell phone. Uh, so that's 195 kilowatt 
um, used uh, per uh, year per household in North Korea. If you are to compare, and we have to be careful with comparison, but it's more for an order of magnitude. If we want to compare with a US household, the average use is 11,000 kilowatt per year for a US household on average. Again, let's be careful with, with, com with comparison, but it's just to give us an, a sense of order of magnitude. There are other energy sources that people use, uh, and I decided to identify two that are interesting. On the left are those capacitators, Soviet era capacitators, which uh, North Koreans still use. They may be one of the last country in the world using those type of capacitators, which unfortunately terribly leak that, that whatever product you put inside to keep a capacitator going and probably leaks all the way down to the, to the rivers and, and oceans uh, uh, near all the way down to, to South Korea. Um, I visited a county named Haichon County, which is uh, two, three hours east of Pyongyang um, and during my, my stay there. The people there had built a dam. They had built the conduits. They even had built the structure for hydropower stations, but there was no equipment to really use the dams and all that's wonderful work that the People's Committee had and the people themselves had uh, worked with back, uh, backbreaking labor. And the generation was barely 20% uh, of, of that capacity. And on the right is a truck which uses biomass, just like World War II Europe, when there was no gasoline, uh, that truck um, has, a, has the capacity to transform um, uh, biomass, mostly wood, uh, crop residue, in order to power uh, this truck. Um, I thought that would be interesting to see that there is a lot of inventive ways of using energy well, as far as the people are concerned. So the power system uh, in North Korea uh, today cannot be repaired without tens of billions of dollars in international cooperation. Um, it's not just the problem of building a capacity for uh, producing energy. Also the transmission infrastructure has not been maintained since the 1990s. Uh, as a result, um, the amount needed uh, to uh, repair the electrical production uh, is uh, absolutely um, uh, beyond the means of the North Korean regime. Um, cities, for example, Wonsan, build uh, hydropower uh, systems, uh, but they cannot uh, distribute it anyway. They keep it for themselves, if you will, which tends to increase the regionalization uh, as far as um, each city is concerned. There is of course coal, uh, billions of metric tons of reserves of varying quality, but in order to extract the coal, you do need electricity for lighting, to use the jackhammers, to move the coal out and to pump the water out. A lot of the mines in North Korea are actually uh, in the West, but are actually below sea level. And since the 1990s, a lot of those mines are flooded. In conclusion, the energy insecurity uh, in North Korea is today the biggest obstacle to developing the economy and society from local to national level and to global technological developments. Health, on the other hand, whereas I find that the, the, the repair of uh, energy infrastructure is perhaps beyond the means, financial means of the North Korean government, to me, health is a, is a failure of governance. The infrastructure in health has been there uh, since, since the beginning of, of North Korea. Each city and county has at least one hospital designated to serve the local people. Uh, there is a household doctor system. About 5,000 household doctors are in place um, in order to provide su close support uh, to, to the people. After all, the system is capable of immunizing 95% of the population is one of the highest numbers in the world. And as we know, is also capable of enforcing population control for pandemics. And finally, there is a high proportion and very high commitment of medical uh, personnel. However, the health system is an empty shell. There is no clean water, no sterile environment, no supplies, no anesthesia, no critical life-saving medicines no lab consumables, no equipment, no safe water, no stable electricity supply and heating. 
Victor Cha thinks that uh, North Korea is the country where the lowest health expenditure per person in the world uh, is uh, taking place. Also, the disparities between rural and urban areas are striking in facilities, in equipment, in medicine or trained staff. The under five mortality is 1.2 times higher in rural than in urban areas. Maternal death, 67% of them occur amongst women who deliver at home, mainly from hemorrhaging because of the poor infrastructure. If the, if the delivery does not go well, you need to bring the mother uh, to, uh, uh, to a facility. Transportation is a problem. Even getting to the hospital, uh, once you're at the hospital is a problem. And those, uh, those maternal deaths occur uh, as a result of poor infrastructure. There is a terrible corruption. The doctors often charge for their services and people are getting turned away if they can't pay. Finally, there are major gaps in the training of the medical equipment in DPRK. These are diseases of poverty in North Korea and capacity, tuberculosis, cholera, malaria, typhoid fever, dysentery, digestive ailments from eating grass and roots. The hospitals, if they were to face an epidemic, would not be able to face it. As to water and sanitation infrastructure, it is also extremely limited. There is a health impact and there is an environmental impact. The health impact is that Today, 33% of people are without access to safely managed water. That number goes to 50% in rural areas. There's a widespread unsafe disposal of human waste, one in five person without access to basic sanitation facilities, and nine in 10 in rural areas. 23.5% of the source water is contaminated. This causes diarrhea, leading cause of child mortality, pneumonia and cholera, stunting in children, and time lost getting water and absenteeism at work. There is also an environmental impact. The water treatment plants operate intermittently. Small towns in rural areas discharge directly into the rivers already experiencing low water levels due to extensive use of surface water by hydropower and agriculture. And the floods and the drought <coughs> regularly destroy critical infrastructure and disrupt the supply chains. Uh, we have seen the long strings of typhoons recently. And of course, uh, it, when there is no typhoon, we have seen the problem of drought, notably in 2018. The government priorities indicate uh, a need for uh, improving all those indicators around infrastructure, key health indicators, having a continuous renewable and reliable energy supply, providing clean and safe water, improving the livelihoods of people by doubling agricultural production, to boost light industries and strengthening the functioning of the industrial sector, including metallurgical, chemical and building material industries. These are the priorities of the five-year plan, um, which the government explained have not been met uh, due to the political situation and, and the sanctioned uh, regime. There is also uh, in the field of international aid, uh, a sense of priority towards energy, health, water, and sanitation, a focus on essential medicines and services, on emergency supplies, but the poor infrastructure disrupts the aid. Cold chain is, is disrupted. Internal transportation is also uh, made, makes delivery of aid very difficult. There's an absence of internal data. The international projects bring rural energy, water and sanitation to people. And I'm giving the example of World Vision given that Randall is here, uh, which offers clean water systems in rural communities, wells, pump, tap and solar in North Wangay and South Pyongan. Um, there is also emergency aid after typhoons. A lot of the aid is about those domains, um, whether it is energy, but it is in rural areas, rural energy, which is renewable, uh, energy such as solar, power, um, and small hydro, uh, or uh, it is about delivering essential medicine and doing water and sanitation. So these infrastructure are, are absolutely um, uh, behind, and the effort of the international community, the international organization, is to try and assist uh, at, that, at that level as well. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Jerome, for this presentation. Um, I think we will have a lot of um, interesting discussions. I see already one question in the Q&A box, and let me just remind you um, that you can ask questions into the Q&A box during uh, the other speakers' presentations. I'll turn now to Matt Kaleza, who's um, going to focus on a, uh, the tourism industry in particular. Um, Matt is uh, hails from Australia and has visited North Korea more than 60 times. He's also an avid and published photographer of North Korea. Um, so without further ado, um, let me turn now to Matt Kaleza. Thank you. Thanks so much, Celeste. Um, thanks everyone for having me. Great to be here. Very excited to be joining you from uh, Melbourne, Australia. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, uh, I uh, used to work for a travel company called Young Pioneer Tours from 2016 until 2019. Uh, I had some pretty great timing last year by wrapping up my North Korea uh, tourism chapter just before COVID hit. Uh, so I uh, haven't been back since late last year, but uh, I'm going to be speaking today about some, some of the, the my um, observations over my time working in North Korea over the last three years. And predominantly uh, the way that the major Chinese spike in tourism has affected the industry, particularly in 2019. Okay. Okay, beautiful. So here I am here with, of course, the, uh, the mandatory haircuts. You can see myself looking a little bit more North Korea friendly at the time than this uh, shaggy COVID uh, ISO beard I've got going. So how the Chinese spike in tourism is affecting the industry for pre-COVID times from 2017 to 2019. So a little bit of a quick history breakdown of, of particularly my time working in the country. We'll just refresh our memories first of all with uh, looking back to 2017, which through very simplistic terms, we're, we're gonna refer to as the bad year. So to jog your memory, 2017 saw in February, the, uh, the uh, execution of uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, uh, half-brother Kim Jong-nam. Uh, we saw the tragedy surrounding Otto Warmbier and the subsequent uh, banning of US tourists. There were 16 missile tests throughout the year, including the first successful IC ICBM uh, test, uh, including two missiles launched over Hokkaido in August and September. And of course, there was the classic saber rattling between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, including two of my favorite international leader disses of all time, Little Rocket Man and of course, The Doted, which of course we all Googled as soon as it was uttered by Kim Jong-un. 2018, simplistic terms, we'll refer to this as the good year. So here we see North Korea and Kim Jong-un in particular entering more into an international diplomacy realm. We saw February, their inclusion uh, at the uh, Pyeongchang Winter Olympics in South Korea. We saw the dismantling of nuclear test sites in May, how, however, quite uh, you know, tokenistic. Uh, we didn't see any uh, uh, tests until 2019 in May. Uh, September saw the return of the mass games, which of course had a major spike in an increase in tourists. And then of course, Kim Jong-un's entry into international diplomacy meeting for the first time, Donald Trump at the Singapore summit, Moon Jae-in three times, and also the minister, uh, the Russian foreign minister, sorry, Sergei Lavrov. However, Kim Jong-un's three meetings with uh, the Chinese president Xi Jinping would have had the biggest impact on the tourism industry going into 2019. So we're gonna see now the impact of Chinese tourism in North Korea. Okay. So um, up until 2019, reports suggest that up to 2,000 Chinese tourists were visiting uh, North Korea in one day. Uh, this would include up to 1,500 alone at the DMZ. Um, if anyone who's watching along has been to the DMZ, um, prior to this, basically you'd, you'd turn up, there'd be maybe one or two other foreign tour groups at best. And as you can see here, just lines and lines of thousand, over a thousand Chinese tourists all at, all at one go. So a lack of infrastructure, pr primarily in hotels, in uh, bus hires, in Korean guides, et cetera, saw that this number eventually was capped to 1,000 tourists per day. And again, you can see here, this is an image I took at the Sosan Hotel. This is a big line for breakfast in the morning. Anyone who's been to North Korea may recall this sort of slightly eerie, empty hotels that you stay in. Reminiscent of The Shining was always a very popular quote. And, um, yeah, 2019 basically flipped that on its head and the hotels were just absolutely ram packed full of particularly Chinese tourists. So what's up with that? What does this mean for tourism in general? 
Um, this photo here was taken at uh, a tourist restaurant in Namyang in North Hamgyong province on the northeast uh, border of China. Uh, this, I'm pulling this, this ridiculous face because I was here probably less than, less than six months prior and this restaurant was absolutely empty. We were the only group of, you know, 10 or so um, Westerners in the restaurant. And then, yeah, just we had to be in and out because I had multiple covers coming through on the tables, a completely different vibe, not just in Pyongyang, but even all the way up in North Hamgyong province, which is just fascinating. So, um, so what is up with that? So in addition to the aforementioned geopolitical developments, a key motivator and theme for Chinese tourists is an interest in going back in time. So with estimations at around uh, 350,000 Chinese tourists throughout uh, 2019, the primary target market uh, is generally older Chinese travelers uh, aged approximately 45 to 60 years old, traveling in large groups, seeking, seeking a nostalgic experience of what China may have been like 40 years ago, coupled with a fascination, of course, with the mysterious socialist neighbor. So this major uh, spike in tourism had a few uh, impacts within the tourism sector. Um, loads of hotels, including the Yang Gakdo Hotel, you'll see here had full renovations. So gone is the bleak concrete Soviet style uh, hotel lobby and now we've gone for this brand new shiny sparkly pastel marble vibe which they've been going for. Hotel Wi-Fi quite amazingly was added to the Potonggang hotel lobby. So this hotel primarily uh, uh, hosts um, Chinese business people and the Yangakdo Hotel Casino which was closed for many years was reopened uh, under SGM Holdings, a Macau uh, company. And as you can see here, the, the casino downstairs in the Young Doctor Hotel offers union pay and also Alipay as well. Um, so yeah, very, very, um, you know, very exciting to see the internet and actually use Wi-Fi in Pyongyang. Never thought I'd see the day. The Daesung department store was also opened up. Well, of course, this is, you know, can be geared towards locals in Pyongyang. The prices and the luxury goods inside, and as well as the amount of Chinese tourists I saw coming in and out of this department store sort of begged to differ a possible other motivation. Kaesong Metro Station also had renovation, renovations. Now this is probably, um, a, a, this is a fixture on almost every single tour itinerary. Kaesong Station is the final stop that all tourists take when visiting the three uh, Pyongyang Metro stops. You can see 2014 versus 2019. The interiors also had full renovations as well. The Chinese Friendship Tower had major renovations as well. And ongoing work, of course, on the Wonsan Kalma Tourist Zone, which is still going to this day, and the Yangdok Hot Spring Cultural Recreation Center as well. So major, major um, uh, developments within the tourism sector. So what challenges did this have for us as a tour company? So the, the biggest problem that we found were train and flight ticket limitations. Um, back in the day, well, back in the day, 2018, um, the earliest visa we could have, we were able to arrange was within 24 hours. So very, very quick turnover. Now we basically need at least minimum three weeks, mainly to ensure that train and or flight tickets were available in and out of the country. Um, this basically um, means that uh, national holiday celebrations as well as the Pyongyang Marathon become very, very tricky to book. Um, Additionally, um, many of the Chinese travel companies have uh, a monopoly on, on getting pre-booked um, tickets. So a lot of them are just completely booked out in advance, which means that even for regular tours, we'd struggle to, to get anyone in. Um, a lack of trains as well. International carriages were quite limited leaving China. So typically most tours that take the train go from Beijing to Dandong and then from Dandong into Pyongyang. And what would happen uh, once you get to Dandong, they would just ram as many people as they could into all of these train carriages. So you packed in like sardines, get you straight across the border. And then once you arrive in North Korea, Korea it's in Sinuiju, everyone would get off the train. The North Koreans would attach new local carriages and everyone would then uh, organize themselves into the new extended train. So the photo here you can see is um, a photo of Dandong Customs coming back in from North Korea um, and just uh, hundreds and hundreds of Chinese tourists all waiting. Um, I would usually say to the tourists I was with, all right, guys, let's get all of our bags ready. The moment that train arrives at the station, we are running to customs. And even when we'd run, we'd still, we'd, we'd be around this point in the line. So 
good fun. Flooding restrictions in the country as well. So this is another big, big issue for Korean um, guides. Um, as you can see, this gentleman here having his morning bong, I uh, couldn't help myself, had to get a photo of this guy. But um, apart from, from, uh, from flooding restrictions, that you'd see um, lots of reports of from the Korean guides on the ground, that is of uh, Chinese tourists very regularly um, walking off from the group, um, leaving the hotel at night, which of course is one of the things that you're not allowed to do as a tourist, taking um, photos of things they weren't supposed to uh, take photos of. Um, and, in, and in some cases I've I heard in Sinuiju as well, um, walking off into rural areas and taking photos and trying to uh, knock on people's doors to speak with them. Um, people uh, in these cases um, uh, often weren't uh, detained as I, as, I, as I was told, but uh, they'd have to pay the equivalent of a 500 US dollar fine um, and they'd be on their, their merry way. So this also had a lack of a lack of Chinese speaking tourist guides affected this industry within the Korean sector specifically. Um, you'd find a lot of the English speaking and Russian speaking Korean guides all of a sudden were all off um, at the Grand People Study House or uh, wherever um, doing uh, Chinese lessons. Um, the entire atmosphere of Pyongyang changed. You'd see all of the key tourist sites such as the Juche Tower, um, gift, all the gift shops were just uh, completely geared towards Chinese souvenirs. Um, and you'd see this really interesting change of character with the local um, guides at each tourist spot, giving these huge, big um, speeches, rooking products to Chinese tourists, which was something that I personally had never seen before. It was very usually someone would sort of get up from behind a desk and just sort of say, okay, yeah, come on, you want to buy something? But very, very different atmosphere and really trying to get people to buy things. Um, so with the with this opening up of more tourists, um, conversely uh, came new restrictions. So most disappointing for me personally was uh, the restrictions on the um, ability for Korean guides to freely socialize outside of the pre-prescribed tour itineraries. So for example, back in the day, you'd finish a big day of, of tour itinerary and it all go to the hotel lobby and have some drinks and debrief. And it was a great opportunity for the Korean guides to speak with, with foreign tourists and foreign tourists to speak with Korean guides and to find common ground and, and just have a, you know, a human to human experience. This now is not allowed. Um, Korean guides uh, have to be with, uh, they have to be in a couple when speaking with foreigners um, at the hotel after the day's itinerary. And it was usually for a very short amount of time as well. So sadly, a scene like this in 2018 with Kiana at the front there, um, not allowed. Increased security as well. Um, you started to see this mysterious third guide in the form of a, a, a state security man or woman joining these tours. Often they would say that they were a trainee guide or a student guide or from the National Tourism Administration. Generally, the role of these third guides was to watch um, the other Koreans, um, and they took um, you know, great pleasure in breaking the rules that they were supposed to be enforcing a lot of the time. Um, and more, most bizarrely, I found was the quote unquote footloose ban on non-approved music. So with this increase in international um, and, and Chinese uh, tourists, um, anyone who's been to North Korea may have remembered the unrelenting musical performances at almost every single lunch and dinner restaurant that you go to. Um, it was great, lots of fun. All of a sudden, no more musical performances allowed except for one state merited uh, band, including these two gentlemen in uh, their smart looking suits. Uh, no more fun, kitschy North Korean pop. Instead, they sing um, operatic traditional Korean folk songs. So a bit of a little bit, a bit of a different vibe. However, music in Sinuiju, the border town uh, next to Dandong in China, totally changed their musical performances to be almost entirely Chinese uh, songs. And this was seen at the Dongrim Hotel, as well as the uh, Bonbu Kindergarten in Sinuiju, where um, the Korean children are now singing songs in Chinese as well for the Chinese tourists. So um, I'm gonna leave you with one of these um, controversial Western songs that, that inspired this ban on, on music, just to leave on a, on, a, 
on a note. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, if anyone would like to keep in touch and or um, speak about any DPRK related things, I always love chatting North Korea. Feel free to hit me up on Instagram and I will uh, play you this extremely controversial version of Under the Sea, North Korea style. Thanks very much. Thank you, um, Matt, with a musical interlude in addition. So, um, Yono, you have a, a tough act to follow. <laughs> now I will um, I so. I'll turn it to our next speaker, who is my dear colleague, Ed G. Wicks, and the organizer of much of um, the great programming that we have, Yono Kim. Um, he is the uh, re associate director of G. Wicks and an uh, Associate Research Professor at the Elliott School. He um, is also a noted um, expert in mobile technology in North Korea, and um, is gonna speak in particular today about mobile money, um, but he's very interested in the relationship between cell phones and the market activity that has been occurring um, in North Korea. So, uh, Yono, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. Thank you, Celeste. Uh, today, I'd like to discuss the increasingly popular airtime or call minute transfer among the North Korean cell phone users. Uh, it's based on my recent report published by USIP. Uh, since Kim Jong-un took power in 2011, North Korea has seen a significant rise in uh, cell phone use. And you can easily see North Koreans, even young students, talking on their cell phones in the streets of major cities in the country. Uh, North Korea introduced a 3G service in late 2008 under the brand name of Koryolink, a joint venture with the Egyptian telecom company Orascom. At first, uh, the subscribers were limited to a small group of powerful and rich people, uh, but the number of subscribers grew exponentially and now it is estimated at at least 4 million. And North Korea built a second mobile telecom network in late 2013, which is Kangsungnet, Kangsungmang in Korean. And it's wholly owned by the Ministry of Post and Telecommunications under the brand name Pyol. And this uh, new network is believed to have secured up to a million subscribers by early 2016. So all in all, it is believed that at least two out of every 10 North Koreans are using cell phones now. Thanks to these changes, uh, North Koreans have come to increasingly rely on cell phone communications for financial transactions. So when they want to make long distance payments or money transfers, they use private networks of wealthy merchants, donju, uh, who function as private local bank branches. Like the Hawala transactions uh, popular in the Middle East and North Africa, the money transfers do not take place in cash, uh, but instead are based on communications between members of a network of Tonju. So uh, receipt of payments is confirmed between senders and recipients by cell phone calls and Tonju, uh, they have their own clearing system. Why do North Koreans bother to use these uh, private human networks for long distance money transfer? Uh, because they don't trust the official banking system. The devastating currency revaluation in late 2009 destroyed trust in the North Korean one among the people and reinforced a preference for a foreign currency for transactions and savings. 
the subsequent dollarization of the economy, along with uh, rampant unauthorized private finance and lending, and also investing for profit, uh, led to unprecedented market activities in many sectors and helped the regime achieve monetary stability. But it came at a cost, uh, which is a non-functioning official banking system. So efforts to restore the trust of potential depositors have largely been unsuccessful, although newly established commercial banks offered competitive interest rates. Uh, North Korea has also introduced various cash cards, but they are accepted in Pyongyang and some major cities only. So cash remains the primary form of payment across North Korea. Uh, North Koreans also transfer airtime or uh, prepaid call minutes for settling small amounts, small sums. Uh, in other words, they treat mobile airtime as a proxy for cash. The recipient can in turn transfer airtime minutes to other people or to professional airtime traders for money. So this indicates there is an active secondary market for uh, airtime. And that's one of the reasons the North Koreans call the prepaid call minutes phone money or chonhwaton in Korean. So I think uh, by phone money, North Korean seem to mean uh, money available only on cell phones. Phone money transfers are widely used by parents whose children serve in the military. So as you know, young North Korean men are subject to 10 years of mandatory military service, but the military fails to provide them enough food. Parents usually cannot send a phone money directly to their sons because cell phones for rank and file soldiers are banned but they can buy food for their sons by transferring phone money to their son's superior officers. So after uh, receiving phone money from parents, the officers give the sons food uh, bought from the merchants doing business near the military base. The amount of food the sons get, however, is less than the phone money would buy at the marketplaces. And in this way, the officers effectively take bribes from the parents. A more convenient way is to send phone money directly to the merchants. And again, the soldiers receive food or even cash from the merchants at unfavorable rates. But still, phone money is the most reliable, most convenient, and fast, uh, fastest way for families to financially support their uh, soldier sons. A phone money transfers can also take place if the recipients agree to provide goods or services at agreed upon uh, prices. It can happen with Changmadang merchants, retail stores, taverns, restaurants, or bus ticket sellers, you name it. And phone money is really useful in an emergency. So one of my interviewees lost his wallet while on long distance business travel but he safely returned home uh, with phone money his wife had sent. So he paid for his one night stay at a tavern, bus ticket and food uh, by transferring phone money from his wife to a tavern owner, a ticket seller and a restaurant owner respectively. And uh, when purchasing small quantities of goods or services, phone money is a good substitute for cash. Uh, merchants at the markets encourage their customers uh, without enough cash to pay with phone money. And there's one example um, I found in the media. Uh, one woman went to Changmadang and made an impulse cosmetics purchase using phone money when she was out of cash. And phone money is also a popular form of gift or bribe. So one interviewee who made a decent uh, money from market activities said that uh, he often transferred phone money to his girlfriend and parents as a gift. And that were an effective way of impressing uh, his girlfriend, he said. And phone money is also a convenient way of sending wedding and birthday gifts to relatives who live in other provinces. 
uh, another interviewee said he sent phone money to the military officer uh, supervising his son uh, to be used for celebrating uh, the officer's birthday. So obviously uh, another way of uh, giving bribe. The practice of using un, uh, prepaid call minutes as a proxy for cash was already seen in some African countries uh, like Kenya uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, after service providers introduced airtime exchange systems, it quickly evolved into a cash remittance substitute. And given the lack of a working banking system, a large unbanked population and the proliferation of cell phones among the unbanked, uh, subscribers found the, uh, that uh, airtime exchange was a convenient alternative to long distance money transfer, which is a service traditionally limited to qualified bank account holders. So uh, Kenya noticed this, uh, the widespread use of airtime as a proxy for money uh, the government launched uh, the M-Pesa uh, mobile platform in 2007. Uh, this platform uh, provided unbanked subscribers with access to financial services, including uh, depositing, sending, and withdrawing funds. Uh, uh, and the M-Pesa service expanded to uh, merchant payments, uh, bill payments, and savings in a virtual account. Uh, money transfer between the service and the bank account, and loans in, uh, per uh, in partnership with banks. So, so many uh, uh, financial services uh, that people could get from this uh, uh, mobile money in Kenya. In many ways, North Korea faces the market conditions that Kenya did uh, before launching M-Pesa. Uh, most of the population is unbanked, and mobile penetration has grown uh, exponentially since the launch of uh, 3G service in late 2008. And private money transfers are uh, still not readily accessible for low income, small amount senders. Even Tonju, they would not uh, bother to transfer less than $50 uh, because they can earn more in fees from larger transactions. So North Koreans might accept the mobile money uh, as an advanced alternative to the phone money system uh, when it comes to a small amount uh, transactions. The mobile telecom service provider has a dominant market position, uh, both in Kenya and uh, North Korea. Uh, both Korea Link and uh, Kangsung Net are managed by the government. So a new mobile money system in North Korea would not face competition for market share. Uh, a true mobile money system could be an important supplement to a functioning uh, modern banking system. Uh, actually, since the, the early 2010s, North Korea has been pushing hard for an electronic payment system by introducing a series of uh, bank-issued cash cards and electronic commerce systems. And uh, in searching for a functioning IT-based financial system, the, the financial policy circle in uh, Pyongyang has shown interest in uh, studying how mobile money works. Uh, if Pyongyang is serious about introducing mobile money, it has a lot of homework to do. Uh, first of all, raising uh, the mobile penetration rate. Uh, in Kenya, even at the start of the mobile money era, 80% of the population had uh, access to cell phones. Uh, by contrast, in North Korea is still some 20%. And the low penetration rate is a product of the extremely high costs of purchasing and topping up cell phones set by the state monopoly power. And in Kenya, the numerous cash in and cash out outlets supported the early success of M-Pesa. So for a successful launch of a mobile money system, North Korea will need to make massive initial uh, infrastructure investments and adopt more customer-friendly service. And in the long term, a North Korean electronic payment system needs to be better aligned with the purpose of uh, mobile money, uh, which is uh, to improve large-scale commerce and economic activity. But so far, Pyongyang has been single-minded about mobilizing financial resources 
uh, for the state's fiscal needs, like uh, absorbing uh, foreign currency from households. The greatest obstacle to a mobile money system is uh, the people's lack of trust in uh, the official financial institutions. So their biggest concern is that a large deposit would raise a, a red flag, uh, leading uh, security agencies to question the source of the funds and possibly confiscate them. So there's still a great uh, gap uh, of uh, you know, tr uh, trust gap between the people and uh, the government. And the dollarization of the North Korean economy is uh, uh, another a fundamental public trust problem. So if the government ignores the reality of a distrusted uh, North Korean currency and limits the uh, mobile money service to uh, one-based uh, transactions, uh, people will see little reason to adopt mobile money. But there are some potential here. Uh, considering these ob obstacles and uh, limited uh, resources, uh, North Korea is likely to cautiously approach uh, mobile money services as it explores the right balance between enhancing services, infrastructure, and market activity, and uh, maintaining economic and political control. Uh, in the initial stages, stages I think uh, it could introduce a money transfer service in one instead of dollar uh, without uh, dramatically increasing the number of official uh, service centers. And mobile money could also be added to the existing mobile payment uh, services at uh, online shopping sites through their intranet. And I think uh, we can also think of payments at state-run stores in major cities, including Pyongyang, uh, market uh, tax payments made by merchants for a vendor stall usage uh, uh, at the Changmadang, and uh, wage payments to employees at SOEs. Uh, let me stop here, and I look forward to the discussion's comments. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Yono. Um, lots of food for thought. I think we're going to um, turn now to uh, Chungo Kim for discussant comments. So Chungo Kim has been our, um, a non-resident uh, scholar here at GWIX. Uh, for two year, the past two years. And previously, he worked as a senior research fellow at the Ex Export Import Bank of Korea. And uh, he has, over his research, focused particularly on the economic um, changes going on in North Korea. So I think he'll have some excellent comments for us. After his comments, we'll um, turn to Randall Spodoni for some discussant comments. And let me just continue to encourage the audience to post questions into the Q&A uh, function uh, so that we can dive right into uh, uh, questions and answers after our discussant comments. So Chungo, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm so much at uh, three of the two that share ideas and opinions with all of you because uh, uh, today's presentations that include all um, the, the very interesting um, issues uh, um, regarding the current changes of North Korea and the potentials of a future development. And so, um, well, I think believe all three presenters have more to speak and share with the audience. So I will shorten my speaking and I will make one comment and one question for each presenter. Um, well, the, I want to talk about uh, two levels of analysis. First, at the micro level um, from the continued observation of the Hermit Kingdom, we have recently found that the more meaningful changes in North Korea under the leadership of Kim Jong-un particularly than before. Um, so we are so excited to discuss every and each sign and clue of the changes uh, of North Korea with the expectation for um, finding correlation or causal relationship between the findings of the present changes and their potentials of a facilitating transformation in the future. Uh, however, on the other hand, at the macro level, 
we find no fundamental changes uh, of uh, the country uh, between the past and present. So uh, North Korea watchers, uh, in the sense, need to keep their works uh, balanced uh, at two levels. Um, since the dissolution of the Eastern Bloc uh, for their survival, the North Korean dictators uh, of the three generations coherently uh, try to adjust themselves to capitalism dominating world by partially adapting non-socialist elements, particularly with lessons from the arduous march in the late 1990s that Kim Jong-il regime wanted to get benefited from riding the wave of China's national economic development, especially the period from 2000 to 2011 uh, was the moment for the Kim Jong-il regime to rec I'm sorry, to, to agonize uh, to what degree their central planning system should or could be transformed. If Kim Jong-il could survive his heart, heart attack um, in late 2011, the then agreements between the leaders of China and North Korea might have helped the North Korea economy rise faster uh, with tremendous amount of investment and aid from China, uh, but uh, it failed in reality. Um, that I understand most of economic policy ideas and operations initiated by the Kim Jong-un regime are actually those that were already designed and considered during his father's ruling period. So the new North Korean leadership after Kim Jong-il was not in good relationship with China. Um, of course, um, after the beginning of a dialogue with the US, uh, the North Korean leadership took a better position in dialoguing with China now. Um, I have a question um, for the Jerome uh, here. Um, while you covered all the critical important issues uh, of a uh, the North Korean public infrastructure and services. Um, the, I the think among many uh, depressing news of North Korea, it is quite gloomy that drugs widely spread over cities and in discriminately rich all ages. So severely damaging our bodies and minds. Uh, do you have anything to share about it? Um, with, I'd love to hear a bit more of it. Um, the, um, I, when you the, the, the develop your analysis of North Korean, the public infra, infrastructure and services, um, the, you may the, think of how the, the the changes of international relations, international relations, particularly inter-Korean relations, uh, uh, impacted uh, at the conditions of uh, North Korean peoples, uh, um, their the life uh, um, in those uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure, um, the services. Um, well, the one good example is that um, the Kaesong Industrial Complex uh, uh, shut down uh, in 2016 that uh, led to the situation. The people in the city of Kaesong um, were, sh were cut off from the stable supply of water because the South Korean side that provided and supplied electricity to the, um, the factory park and also the move the, 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 the machine to pump water to the factory and also to the, the city of Kaesong. 
Okay, and I have a um, question for Matt. Uh, Matt uh, uh, brought today to us a, a very interesting um, the perspective, um, particularly when we uh, deal with North Korean problems. Um, of course, the tourism uh, has a, a tremendous uh, degree of uh, positive effect on the society uh, of North Korea. Uh, so the people may have a more uh, wider, I mean, wider the window to contact with the outside. Um, of course, economically, they will get benefited from uh, the tourism industry. Um, concerning tourism, um, uh, there are three issues that uh, um, we should think uh, seriously. First is ethics issues. Um, is it proper for the world to encourage tour um, packages to North Korea while North Korea um, isn't isn't the, the complying to the international laws and the norms and human rights issues and so forth and so on. Um, the second issue is the safety issues. Um, so when tourists uh, visit um, the North Korea, uh, how do you guarantee, how do you provide the guarantee of a, a tourist safety? Well, the one Korean and one American uh, was shot and was killed in on the land of North Korea before. So uh, it, th those two cases imply much for future um, development of tourism. A third issue is money. So what can be the cost of a tourism for the tourists? Um, well, the last year, the Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, kind of a requested or commented that the, the number of Chinese tourists to North Korea uh, should be increasing up to 5 million. Um, well, I think a Chinese travel agency is, uh, um, may be able to mobilize uh, enough number of tourists uh, for uh, North Korean sightseeing. Um, However, money matters. Um, I just have uh, all the data, uh, but the, based on the data I have, uh, I can guess enough that, that, that some or many of the Chinese tourists had received the um, Chinese government subsidy when they joined. The tourism package. Well, it was the same for the South Korean uh, tourism uh, project packages uh, for North Korea. Uh, so government subsidy um, is invisible in many ways. Uh, the money that flows into uh, various kinds of accounts uh, to support uh, the, the tourism package. Um, if the money size, I mean, the subsidy size increases, uh, it will bring a serious problem later. Uh, well, if you have uh, any idea, uh, please uh, share your uh, point of view. Um, lastly, I wanna the, the, the have, a, have a question for Yono. Um, the Yono's at the, Description and analysis of a phone money is a very attractive and it gives us a, uh, a hope for uh, the further and aggressive changes in North Korea uh, in terms of technology and not in terms of finance. Um, well, finance is not a simple issue. Um, in order to discuss uh, uh, finance issues with airtime, um, it needs a fundamental 
uh, reshuffle of the financial system. Um, anyway, uh, airtime uh, story is a very encouraging for many North Korea watchers. But uh, I simply wonder uh, to what degree people may pursue the accumulation of airtime for the transaction in the market. Uh, well, the, in theory, there is no maximum limit for each person, uh, each mobile subscriber to keep airtime in his or her account. But uh, in what sense and with what kind of mo motivation uh, will the people keep the airtime and how can the airtime be used to um, help people increase their wealth, uh, not only to transact with others. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Jungo. I think we have some interesting questions here um, for Jerome about the drugs uh, side of the health question, about um, the ethics, safety, and costs, or potentially uh, government subsidized uh, portions of the tourism industry, um, as well as the uh, hoarding or saving of airtime minutes for Yono. I'm going to, um, before we have the, the speakers address those questions from Chungo, let's turn over now to Randall Spadoni for another set of discussant comments. And let me encourage uh, questions and answers, or sorry, questions, but not answers yet in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So Randall Spadoni is the North Korea Program Director and Senior Regional Advisor um, for Asia Pacific at World Vision. And he has been working on pro um, projects related to disaster relief, nutrition, and clean water in North Korea uh, for more than a decade now. So I think he'll bring a very interesting perspective to our um, presentations today. So let me turn it over now to Randall. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Celeste, and thanks for inviting me. Especially nice to be on the panel with Jerome. We worked for several years together when he was a resident coordinator on some of these developmental issues. Um, and thank you for, to, this, to the panelists for their presentations. All really interesting and interesting to try to bring together those uh, different aspects of development, mobile phones, tourism, infrastructure together. So and listening to it, uh, a few themes emerged to me. Um, and these are areas related to if, uh, the economy and public infrastructure. If North Korea, if the DPRK wants to create, improve its infrastructure and economy, it has to create uh, greater efficiencies and it has to generate capital. And I've seen that over my 15 years now working with the DPRK. Um, every time the DPRK reinforces its, uh, its system of social and economic control, it just creates all these new unintended inefficiencies and in effect it undermines its own goals when it does that and it amazes me each time i visit the country to see how much time is spent at the individual level or the institutional level then working around those inefficiencies working around that that system just to get things done and often not get things done as well as uh, as well as they could as well as you would like and the mobile payment system that yonho mentioned or, and wrote about extensively is a great example of that workaround. I mean, here's, here's a system that could be established formally or, or filled by many parts of the private market. It just happens that the cell phone companies were given enough freedom um, and capital to, um, and then the individuals basically, entrepreneurs basically created this economic system within the mobile payment, you know, within the mobile system. And there are probably hundreds of other creative examples of economic activity that we're not aware of going on in North Korea right now. Um, and especially with COVID, I'm sure a lot are emerging there and we just don't have insight into them. So one, one example I'll use of the uh, challenge of raising capital in, in the DPRK um, is the ability of uh, to actually maintain their infrastructure. And Jerome um, talked about this a little bit. You, you need to be able to not just build a system but to maintain it over the long term. And to do that, uh, DPRK organizations need to have their own way of 
raising resources consistently over time and then having access to, to purchasing materials. So um, Coriolink does that or the cell phone companies do that through their phone charges or the transfer fees uh, that Yonho mentioned, which I think are really uh, interesting way of, of raising um, um, funds across the country. You, you've probably seen some news that uh, highways have now opened up their own professionalized toll booths and they have their prices posted and the military are much more professional than they used to be. That's a way of generating, generating consistent income for, for uh, infrastructure. Uh, when tourism was opened up in 2019, as Matt mentioned, that industry raised its own resources and you could start to see innovation and improvement in the hotel industry. Um, but other, other industries or other sectors like electricity or health don't seem to have those ways of raising that kind of decentralized, more private, uh, ongoing private support. And I think that's uh, that'll be a question for us in the development field to, to think about in the future. I've stayed at hotels in the middle of winter that didn't have access to electricity or heat. Sometimes we're running out of food uh, and they were often competing with other industries for that electricity, for example, the railroads. So, you know, they're on the phone using their network of relationships, trying to get electricity into their uh, into their hotel. But uh, but no consistent way of, of funding that sector, at least at the level that, that it needed to. Um, when I arrive in Pyongyang uh, at the airport there, the first place I go to is the Coriolink stall to uh, reinstate my cell phone card and to buy top-up cards. And I brought one right here. That's what I get when I get in the country. Um, and there's a fee to that, but the efficiencies that are created far outweigh any costs. So when I'm on the road, going from my hotel to the sites in the field, I'm constantly on the phone with other NGOs in the US. I'm sending emails, talking with my counterparts there. They're making calls inside the country. We're solving issues together. We're creating efficiencies and we make a lot of progress just by my ability to access the international markets basically and their ability to access the domestic markets. But aside from my time in the country there, they really, that efficiency falls apart. The, you know, the cell phone system is completely domestic inside the country. And when I'm outside the country, I don't have access to uh, calling into Pyongyang. You, you really have to find some way around that. Um, so there's just so many institutional barriers inside the DPRK that hinder the development of the tourism sector, that hinder the development of in infrastructure. Um, you know, we, we actually, World Vision actually builds infrastructure in the country, small scale clean water systems, Jerome mentioned that. And so on a small scale, we, we face many of the same issues that the country does on a larger scale. Um, we have to build the very lowest tech systems inside the country because we, the communities don't have the access to resources to maintain anything that's, that, you know, that's higher tech that needs replacement parts from China. They don't have the money, they don't have the networks of, of um, the market networks to be able to buy those materials. Even accessing their own Rasun special economic zone, that's even harder than accessing China. So within the country, just these, these um, barriers that are, that are put up between the provinces or between their SEZs, um, greater freedom of movement around the country. You can't just hop in a car and go down and visit a project site and work out issues. Um, freer exchange of technical expertise. I mean, that's been helped a bit by the cell phone network, but, um, but there are so many silos within North Korea and projects just get done to a poor quality and with less efficiency. Um, so still many barriers inside the DPRK and those areas where the government allows a little bit more freedom, like with the cell phone sector, you start to see some innovation and improvement, but there really has to be more, more of that in the future. And uh, I'm not gonna ask a lot of questions of the panelists, but maybe I'll just leave a, a general question out there about how, how we can encourage um, this more decentralized private um, uh, generation of resources uh, to, to build up the, um, the stability of sectors in the country and to create a, 
uh, better access for the citizens of the country to um, economic opportunities. And I think that's something that the UN can influence, World Vision and other NGOs and private businesses as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Randall. I think you paint a really excellent picture with some nice examples of this Janus faced nature on the one hand, state control and institutional barriers, as you described. Um, and on the other hand, some really uh, phenomenal, creative, bold uh, initiatives by individuals, whether it's privately or even semi privately, uh, be, um, you know, that at times may encourage corruption, but can also um, lead to the flourishing of different sectors in North Korea. And I think unpacking that um, across the public infrastructure, tourism, and um, mobile sectors will be really interesting today. So thank you for those comments. Um, I wanted to turn now to, in the order, Jérôme and then Matt and then Yono to respond to our discussants, and then we'll um, tackle some of the questions that have been raised in the Q&A box. So Jérôme, do you wanna take it away? Thank you, Celeste. Uh, very briefly, um, on, on drugs in uh, in the country, um, I, I I don't know a whole lot. Uh, there, there was quite a bit of marijuana smells uh, uh, around. In even I'll be very honest with you, even in my own office, uh, sometimes there was a guy who was who was smoking marijuana. I was I was always a bit surprised about that. Um, but um, that the, the but, but in terms of heavy drugs, I, I, of course, like everybody, I heard about it. Uh, I know that they do uh, come across the border, but I, that's, that's all I know. Uh, I think it's a problem, certainly. Um, life is hard and, and people will want to, to, to be taking drugs. On the issue of um, that, uh, Jun Ho, you were asking about the um, uh, infrastructure linked to the international situation in a way, um, it's always like that. Indeed, North Korea will always think of energy uh, solutions as linked uh, to um, to the uh, to the international uh, uh, situation, as we know in the example of the 80s, 90s, uh, when um, uh, the U.S. was able to finance uh, with Kado uh, some of these some of these repairs. We should never forget in North Korea the importance of the political. Uh, it's it's very important, and 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 I, and I remember I arrived in November 2009. When all of a sudden people had money, because they were it was it was they were doing business, and the redenomination in 24 hours wiped out everybody's savings, and uh, that's because there was a sense that there was a bit of a middle class coming around, and uh, back then the Kim Jong Il regime thought that you know it was it was a bit of a threat, and uh, that uh, those those savings were wiped out. So coming to the building of capital, how to generate capital. There's always that cloud hanging over that the political may take over the economic uh, at any time, and and that's in, is in the mind of everyone. And uh, people have to be very careful. Mobile money is partly a solution, but again, I'm wondering if the fact that there's only five million cell phone is also partly a political uh, aspect. It's not just economic, in my opinion. Um, the regime may want to limit the number of cell phone to a number. Uh, that they consider is that they can they're willing to live with the um, issue of that Randall mentioned is really so important is is how to build capital. Um, I just want to introduce one dimension that touched on it a little bit is the role of towns, cities, regions. Um, there are certain regions that seem to be trying to make a bit of a go at it. I mean, again, I mentioned one son. Uh, when one son was uh, developing its um, hydropower and had visited several hydropower um, um, installations, um, they were making sure that the electricity uh, was was uh, was being kept uh, for the city. And I did notice improvement in the hotel that we always go to in one son. Uh, I felt the electricity was getting better during my time from the beginning. So I think there's also a regionalization uh, aspect. It's possible that uh, some cities uh, may try, whether for the health system or for other infrastructure, may try to sort of go it alone a little bit and build their own improvement. Um, I was in Chongjin once and uh, we were visiting the health uh, institutions over there and I felt that the, uh, you know, the, the, the 
the managers over there, if you want, the, the government people, uh, were trying to find solutions that were on their own without worrying too much about the central level because there was not much they could expect from them. Um, so that's just a, a, some, some element of, uh, of an answer. Um, and just uh, finally, um, to John Ho, when I was there, what I experienced was the rise of China. It was really China coming in and, and taking the place of South Korea at the time. And uh, when I was there, the, the electricity support uh, was, was not, there was not, nothing happening uh, from that perspective. But again, South Korea has always offered to bring in electricity, uh, both transmission lines and power generation uh, to, to at least the Southern part of the country. Uh, there was actually a plan, an offer on the table from South Korea to spend a billion dollar a year to bring electricity and a billion dollar uh, to uh, improve uh, transmission lines. So it was really there, uh, but it's always linked to the political aspect of the relation. Uh, that's what brings me back to always bringing to the political. And that's why finally on the micro level of change and the macro level of change, that's what it's so interesting to look at what's happening at the micro level of change. because That's where the change is happening. That's where the change will come from. And that's why all the organizations like Randall's uh, World Vision and others are I, the fact that they're working at the macro level is 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 where we can affect change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll turn it now to Matt. Okay. Hello. Thank you for your question. Um, great juicy question to get stuck into. So um, ethics of traveling to North Korea. Um, great question. Um, something that I personally myself um, struggle with. You know, I have certain times that I'm like, oh, this is you know problematic. Um, personally, I think. I, I'm sort of on the fence that that almost tourism as a general concept is morally questionable at the best of times, particularly visiting um, undeveloped or developing countries um, as a Westerner. Um, that being said, though, um, I do think that there is a lot of um, a lot to be gained from having tourism in, in North Korea. Um, on a very basic level, I believe that um, tourism in North Korea um, supports a small but developing tourism in, in, industry in in North Korea, um, pr provides jobs to hotel staff, bus drivers, tour guides, um, both for, for the groups and for the local sites we visit. Um, and I, I believe that for a country that is as closed off as North Korea, um, tourism is a very small window, but still an important window that should exist for tourists to see that North Korea, you know, there's more going on than Kim Jong-un pointing at things and missile tests. It is a country that, that has, people going about living their lives and, and getting on with things. Um, of course, it's like, it's definitely possible to just go there and, and be a voyeur and not engage at all. And that would be something that I would always try to encourage tourists to, to do, to actually engage with the people that you meet, engage with the, the, the guides, get something out of this for both sides of the, of the picture. Um, I guess, yeah, essentially, I, I just, I don't believe that, that for a country that is as closed off from the world as North Korea is, I don't believe that further shutting them out by not having tourism um, helps anybody really, North Koreans or, or our understanding of, of this country. Um, but if, yeah, of course, like if you go to North Korea, it's, it's riddled with propaganda and that's something that as well that tourists need to be aware of and, and filter through accordingly. Um, I think that if you're a, a curious person about 20th century history, about, the, about Cold War history, about um, globalization, um, it's, it's a fascinating, um, experience um, and personally yeah on, on, a, on a personal level I think the, the friendships that I've made with with the North Korean partners we have over there that we would work with um, I, I hope that things change the better for them I hope that their, their lives improve and I think that tourism is, is a way that that can happen for a small group of people not only in Pyongyang but throughout the entire country um, and I understand that it's definitely not for everyone you know I, I, I don't expect that everyone should or, or would want to go to North Korea. But, um, but for me personally, I think um, that tourism is, a, is an important small window to, to keep our understanding going, as, as long as you're a, a responsible uh, tourist in the way that you're engaging with, with this country. Um, as far as money goes, I'll sort of tie that in as well. Um, I mean, the cost of a stand, I mean, all the tour companies are competing with each other, obviously, but the cost of a sort of standard five-day tour is just under a thousand US dollars. Um, However, this includes um, obviously your visa to get into North Korea. It includes your train ticket 
both in and out, that's four train tickets. So from Beijing to Dandong to Pyongyang. Um, it includes all of your hotel accommodation. It includes all of your meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It includes um, the payment to KITC, which is the Korea International Travel Company's two guides. It includes the bus driver, the bus hire, the petrol. It includes paying uh, uh, fees to certain sites that we visit for tourists just to, to be able to turn up without having to fork out any money. And of course, I wasn't doing it for free as well. So I need to get a wage on top of the tour company's profit as well. So I think for, you know, uh, when you sort of break it down like that, it's there's, there's certainly other ways I think that North Korea um, profit that uh, more significant than tourism. Um, and I would, I would argue that the, the things I, I mentioned before, um, such as just the, the cultural um, interactions far outweigh um, the, the financial. Um, as far as safety is concerned, um, I mean, yeah, that's, that's something that is at the end of the day, um, tourists are, you know, that we are, we are, we are, all tour companies take only people who are over 18. So, um, there's a certain, you have to be an autonomous, responsible adult. Um, there are contracts I know that all tour companies sign that um, basically uh, very clearly outline the, 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 the do's and don'ts of um, the safety of travel. Um, every tour company, including the one I worked for, also holds pre-tour meetings, um, which can last up to two hours, which include, again, full briefing of the do's and don'ts. There's ample time for questions. Um, it's very, very clear on what you can and what you can't do. Um, I believe since 1996, there's been uh, 17 you know, fairly arbitrary arrests of predominantly Americans um, for anything such as leaving a Bible behind in a bathroom to propaganda posters being torn down to journalists sneaking across the border without a visa, um, provided that people follow the very, very basic rules that are set forward before a tour. Um, there are thousands and thousands of um, Western tourists who go to North Korea every year with, with, with zero incident. Um, and I think that that's just, um, you know, it's, it's an easy sort of thing to be frightened about and with good reason, but for the most part, it's, it's quite rare. It's, a, it's quite a safe country to travel in, I found. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'll turn finally to Yono and encourage you, uh, the audience, to continue submitting questions to the Q&A box. Okay, thank you. Um, I think Jungho just uh, touched upon the, the core uh, you know, question that we have to address uh, down the road uh, if uh, North Korea wants to pursue this uh, mobile money system. Uh, so yes, uh, you know you ha you have to be really careful, uh, you know, from North Korea's point of view uh, when you decide to introduce mobile money, uh, and I think uh, you know uh, without any uh, dramatic changes uh, surrounding, I mean, the, the political and diplomatic, uh, you know, environment dr uh, dramatically changing uh, surrounding the Korean Peninsula, uh, North Korea if and when they decide to uh, introduce mobile money system, that means they have figured out how to control uh, the flow of money and uh, you know, the electronic uh, transactions. Um, but uh, I guess they're not there yet. They're just studying and very interested in uh, this new technology. Uh, so well, obviously they're, they have been very cautious about that. And just uh, you know, uh, leaving the people uh, you know enjoying this uh, new uh, phone money uh, you know uh, uh, services, and uh, whether the phone money can be a tool for hoarding wealth. Um, obviously, you know when you uh, accumulate your phone money, uh, it's really easy for the security agency to uh, detect that, right? So you, you don't want to use your own uh, a cell phone, probably uh, you know, using in Korean tepo phone, you know, registered under somebody else's uh, name. That way you can uh, you know, escape the, the government's monitoring system. Um, and uh, if you, I were a uh, you know, um, officer who are taking bribes uh, uh, you know, in the form of phone money, I would take uh, the phone money also under, you know, the, uh, on the cell phone registered under other people, but also uh, take a prepaid phone card also. If you remember uh, the, the 
Korean, uh, you know, famous Korean TV drama, Crash uh, Landing on You. You may remember the scene uh, where, um, you know, the, the military officer, like Coast Guard person taking a phone card as a bribe. Uh, it looks really, you know, simple and uh, easy, uh, you know, way to accumulate your, uh, your wealth, uh, you know, from taking bribe, right? Uh, and the phone, uh, I think Bill Brown asked this question, uh, the price of phone money uh, has been relatively stable over the last several years, according to my interviewees and uh, source. So uh, that way you can, I think, um, <clears throat> hold, um, um, you know, use the airtime as a tool for holding your wealth. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so far, I should uh, emphasize that phone money is for small, small amount transactions, uh, not even big amounts because it is really inconvenient to transfer uh, airtime uh, on the cell phone network. Um, so uh, there is no limit to how many times you can transfer the airtime, but there's a limit to uh, the amount you can transfer for each uh, in a transaction. So it is uh, airtime uh, you know, worth one and a half dollar. Uh, which is not a big amount in this country, but you know, a kind of a serious amount to the uh, you know people in the street in North Korea. So, for example, if you want to transfer fifty dollars, uh, uh, I mean, the airtime worth of fifty dollars, uh, if you do the math, you have to uh, make a transfers thirty-five times, plus uh, uh, paying fees, which is uh, not that convenient. So. I, I was told that um, when it comes to uh, um, phone money transfer, people usually uh, transfer airtime equ equivalent to 10 to $20. Uh, that's uh, doable. And that's a uh, uh, you know, uh, decent amount for like, uh, you know, uh, sending airtime for your uh, you know, relative's birthday uh, you know, gift. Uh, that's what I was told. And Randall's question, uh, that's really a fundamental question. And uh, I don't know the solution um, to encourage private uh, generation resource, uh, you know, to contribute to the you know, stability in the economic sector. Uh, obviously, in a country like North Korea, uh, the government market policy really matters. And so far, Kim Jong-un has been relatively lenient compared to his father's uh, market policy and try to utilize the market. But after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, there are uh, some reports that uh, you know, uh, the government tried to squeeze uh, you know, private uh, money uh, uh, from, uh, by like, uh, you know, uh, uh, cracking down on uh, private uh, market uh, actors uh, for whatever reason they can find. And also, for the market to be active, uh, you know, there should be uh, economic engagement uh, by North Korea with the international uh, society, like trading, right? And a lot of uh, human or uh, financial exchanges. Uh, that's something we cannot see nowadays. So that those two big variables, I think, really matters. But uh, as you know, uh, at, at least for now, uh, we don't see uh, that big, uh, you know, big light, uh, you know, at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yono. Um, we have about 10 more minutes uh, for questions and I'll start off by combining a question from a former student, Chong No, who works at Radio Free Asia now. Um, and I think this builds on Yono's last comment. Uh, so we see now a North Korea affected by sanctions, increasingly tight sanctions um, and the COVID pandemic. Um, so per perhaps for Jerome, you can answer um, this question that chong -no had about uh, the Pyongyang hospital construction, whether it's proceeding, uh, and then more broadly uh, in the health sector, uh, what effects of COVID plus sanctions already existing do you see on the ground? Uh, on the construction of the, of the hospital, uh, there will always be an allowance for Pyongyang. Um, there will always be a need to make Pyongyang a beautiful city on the hill. Uh, that it is, by the way, um, and um, to, to be sure that it is the showcase. So 
uh, hospitals uh, that are shining and, and, and beautiful uh, uh, will always be there. Um, I use the, 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 the hospital for the friend of the friendship hospital. Uh, it's, it's not great, but at least uh, they, they took care of me a little bit and, until they, they could not. And so there is, there will always be that, that capacity uh, in Pyongyang and in some of the major towns for, for, a, for, for a hospital like, the, like this hospital that they're building. Um, as to the, the question on, on the supplies and COVID, yeah, I am certain that the authorities uh, know that if there was, uh, uh, in the, the, if COVID-19 was hitting uh, North Korea in, in any serious way, the, the health system would be incapable of, of answering it and it would be an absolute disaster. And so their, their rational response is to just shut everything down uh, and, and make sure that just nobody moves uh, in order to, to, to ensure that the epidemic, which after all began in China next door, um, is, is, not, is not happening. As to the sanctions, yes, um, the, um, the, the sanctions affect all of Korea's infrastructure. Clearly, Randall was mentioning maintenance of the equipment, uh, availability of spare parts, uh, available, and we know the ability of the fuel, uh, all of that is strictly uh, controlled under the sanctions regime. Uh, as to medicine, as you know, normally uh, the sanctions do not apply uh, to the uh, humanitarian uh, aspects of things and med uh, medicine should not be included. And there is delivery of essential medicines. Uh, having said that, uh, the availability of essential medicine is, uh, is also very, very low. Um, so yeah, we will continue to see a construction like the, like the Pyongyang hospital, uh, as part of the great projects of, um, of, of the showcase that is Pyongyang. Thank you. Another question from Radio Free Asia reporter, Kim Soyoung, and she, this might be for Matt. Um, so she asks if, uh, basically if looking towards the future to what, under what conditions might you see tourism resuming? into North Korea, um, which it, it seems to have been cut off quite starkly uh, due to COVID. Um, as most of us are homebound, <laughs> I guess, in, in this situation. Uh, but Matt, if you could address that, and um, she had a specific question about the uh, mass games preparation for the upcoming 75th um, Party Foundation Day here in a couple of days. Um, yeah, so, I mean, as we know, North Korea was, I think, the first country to totally close its borders. And I think it'll be probably the last to reopen. Um, uh, I, I believe I read that they said they wouldn't be reopening until there was a vaccine. Um, uh, that sounds probably pretty accurate to me. Um, I know that pretty much all the tour companies have just scrapped all tours up until at least next year. Um, but yeah, as, as far as... Um, as I, 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 I don't know, nobody knows, I don't think. And anyone who think, I think who says they know doesn't know. It's, um, it's all, tourism in North Korea is a very, very um, fickle uh, beast at the best of times. So I think it'll be quite some time before tourists are going back there. Um, as far as um, the mass games go, um, I believe I saw um, some photos that were posted on NK News of, uh, that were allegedly uh, dated from a month or two ago that um, pictured um, practicing happening outside of the May Day Stadium. Um, yeah, it was, it was, that was pre-National Day. So um, nothing has happened. We've got uh, the 70, I don't know why I say we, it's not we, they, North Korea have the 75th Party Foundation Day uh, to a, a, a holiday coming up uh, on the 10th of October, which is, what, very soon. Um, so that possibly could be a, a mass games, maybe a small run one night only, who knows? But again, I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not too sure. I, um, I haven't been actually on the ground since, since 2019. So it's all speculation for me at this point. Good, thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question from one of our students at GW, um, Che Gonu, who asks uh, if, tourism had become North Korea's sort of alternative source of foreign currency. What does that mean uh, in this COVID era for North Korea's foreign currency situation? Yeah, I mean, I, I personally don't think that it's, I mean, I, 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 I'm more concerned about what 
jobs people are doing within that industry but i don't think as a grand scheme of north korea that the the tourism industry I, I think it's a bit of a drop in the ocean compared to other ways that they they make money um to get around sanctions um there's you know load, loads of reading to be done on it from uh, uh, weapons dealing to um counterfeit currency to um even just you know trade with china for example um so i i don't think personally that's the lack of tourism is going to have a drastic effect on their foreign currency coming in. Thank you, Matt. Um, I wanna turn now to a set of questions that Bill Brown asked, um, and these are about prices for a variety of different things. So Bill asked, for example, um, on the pricing of energy, would uh, more rational pricing improve e efficiencies? And I think this gets at what Randall was describing in some sense. Um, Bill then also asked, uh, as Yonel mentioned, about how stable airtime prices have been. Um, and he is curious to know um, from Matt how, uh, driver, how much drivers get paid, say, for the bus tours uh, that you have experienced, and uh, to what extent these are reliable sources of in income for individual individuals who are essentially doing what Randall described as a workaround to try to um, get by in a relatively controlled system. So I guess why don't we start backwards with Yono, then Matt, and then Jerome about um, the pricing questions that Bill Brown, Bill Brown raised. Yes, uh, as I said, um, the phone money uh, prices are, seems to be relatively stable, uh, according to my interview as in, uh, source. And probably um, you know wouldn't go down that dramatically because uh, there's obvious interest from the government's point of view to uh, rake in uh, you know foreign currencies from from the uh, the household so that's one of the really uh, you know easy and uh, quick way for the government to uh, accumulate uh, uh, US dollars uh, from within um, so that's uh, what I have been told. Uh, and, um, you know, who knows? I mean, down the road, uh, what would happen to, to the uh, prices of phone money? That's totally up to the government policy. And depending on that, the market would react. Thank you. Matt, how about the drivers for the buses and um, whether you have a sense of how much of the approximately $1,000 ends up um, benefiting local? uh business people yeah so as far as um uh bus drivers go for example um I, I i i couldn't say to be honest um the way that it works basically is as you go on the tour um the uh, koreans are co collecting receipts for certain things going to get petrol um for certain additional costs at different sites restaurants etc um, receipts are then collated at the end of the tour and sent as a, as a lump sum receipt to the foreign tour companies um, who then pay in cash once in the country every every you know month or so. Um, uh, yeah, as far as uh, benefiting them specific, uh, individually, um, all tour companies um, obviously really uh, promote tipping the guides and the drivers, as well as in addition, um, bringing along uh, gifts. Um, which the Koreans are quite specific about the gifts. They're not actually really a gift. It's more of a, uh, please bring cigarettes, foreign cigarettes, please bring foreign whiskey, please bring foreign cosmetics. They're the sort of the three sought after things. And of course, these gifts are either, you know, in, in some cases, of course, they're, they're kept by, by the guides, but um, I presume in, in many cases, they're either traded, used for bribes or re resold in the jang madans. So, um, that's that can be quite quite um quite um yeah quite a haul some tours when you sort of you collect from everyone and then you you give them on to the guides very subtly in bags individually portioned between the three of them um the 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 tips are given as a golden handshake in a, in a brown envelope without anyone seeing so it's all very you know under the radar and 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 how much of that they then personally keep versus how much they I'm sure they would have to give the managers of the, the tour companies a cut as well. That's all North Korea stuff that I'm, I'm not sure about what happens after I leave the country. 
Thank you. I think, Jérôme, you'll have the final yep. word today um, since well, we're running out of time. Okay. So let me just ask you to sort of wrap us up with also um, a few comments about to get to Randall's questions Yes. Um, in terms of how to generate um, capacity yep. or capital um, and encourage the type of private entrepreneurship and um, creative I, I would, work. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I, I would say for, first on pressing, I think, uh, the question of Bill Brown was really, can pricing make those systems more efficient? And, and I mean, my answer is, and Randall might know more than me, but the problem is the lack of data here. I, I am quite sure that the North Korean authorities do not know how much their energy is priced, or if they know, they do not share that with the various uh, part of the country that utilize. It's not like you receive an electricity bill. Um, the same for the health system. I was in Hamhong asking a health, um, the, the, the head of the health system there, uh, what's your budget? And he couldn't tell me. He did not have a budget. So um, the, the pricing would begin with having a bit of data and the lack of data is a major problem. Um, and really on the most important question, which is Randall's question, how can we encourage this decentralized private gen generation of resources and better access to the people um, I, I continue to be an advocate of, of, of that small scale that Jun Ho was, was talking to at, at the level, that small scale of change where the NGOs, the UN, and where the people who are using cell phones are operating. This is where change is happening. This is where um, resilience, but also agency is taking place. And you, you cannot sort of wait for, you know, Pyongyang to tell you what, what's going to happen. People have to make it happen on their own. And I think the support has to be to continually support those small accesses, rural energy, uh, rural health, water and sanitation process, increasing the access to cell phones, um, finding in the ways to, to get money in people's hands uh, so that they in turn can pay the doctor uh, or, or pay for a, for a battery uh, that will power their cell phones. Uh, so it's really, uh, I'm, I would be an advocate for continuing to find ways to put money in people's hands uh, so that they in turn can capacitate and create access for themselves. Thank you. I think that wraps up our discussion very nicely. <laughs> I'm sorry to put you on the spot to do that today, but thank you. It was perfect. Um, I want, please join me in thanking, although we can't exactly via Zoom, our three speakers and two discussants today. And I um, appreciate all of the participants that joined us from all over the world. Um, so thank you very much. And um, please, as Yono mentioned, um, stay tuned for the part two of this North Korea Economic Forum uh, next week. Okay, so thank you very much and have a good rest of the day. Mm -hmm.